One of the hardest parts of any project is doing all the behind the scenes work. The work that's rarely noticed by the end user. A saying that seems to hold true with most software projects is 90% of the work happens in the last 10% of the project. Pouring hours of effort into a system that no user will ever see is the worst feeling and leads to a severe lack of motivation. Despite all of this, these hidden components are required for a functioning system. Today, we're going to be talking about one such system I've been working on developing over the past few weeks. So with that said, let's dive into the workings of the Gearflux permission system. But before we do that, I just want to say a huge thank you to the channel members. If you like what I do and are interested in becoming a member, click the join button below the video. So why do we even need a permission system? While a permission system might not be the most interesting feature to implement, it's still a critical part of a Minecraft server. Managing player permissions is vital, as without a proper permission system, it is extremely difficult to set up effective moderation. Normally in a project like this, I would just use LuckPerms, as it's a fantastic project and has pretty much everything you need when it comes to a permission system. However, those of you who watched the last video will know that I'm no longer using paper or spigot. In short, I'm now using a software called Mindstomp. If you want to learn more about what Mindstomp is and why I decided to switch, check out the last video. There should be a card somewhere in the top right. Unfortunately, there's no Mindstomp support for LuckPerms. Mindstomp does have a built-in permission system. But because our server is distributed, the permission system has to sync across many different server instances, and even proxies. For this reason, I decided that creating my own permission system would be the best option. So where do we even start with creating a permission system? How does it even work? Well, you can think of it as a big tree, where every leaf is a permission node, and every branch is a connection. These nodes can be anything, for example admin, or mod, or player, or anything else. Then, each of these leaves has a branch to other leaves. For example, we could have admin.commands where the first permission node would be admin, and then under that, we'd have another one called commands. This is called a hierarchical permission system. Every permission node can have a tree of permissions under it. This hierarchical method allows us to organize permissions in a way that makes sense. For example, if we have a top-level role called admin, we might want many different permissions underneath that, and even other permissions with permissions under them. Now that we have a concept for this system, how can we go about implementing it? Well, remember that this system has to sync across many different server instances, so for that reason, we're going to need a database. On the topic of databases, have you ever wanted to learn how to build your own? Well, now you can with CodeCrafters. CodeCrafters is a platform designed to elevate your programming skills through advanced challenges, like building a database from scratch. With support for a wide range of languages, you can explore and master both familiar and new technologies. Plus, you can collaborate with a vibrant community of developers. It's free to sign up, and if you decide to upgrade, you get 40% off with my link in the description. Whether you're an experienced coder or just starting out, CodeCrafters offers the perfect hands-on approach to learning. If that sounds interesting to you, check it out with the link in the description. Now let's get back to the video. So, we're going to need a database to store our permissions. But the question is, which one? With so many different options and so many different styles of data storage, we have to choose the model that best suits our needs. There are many different types of database to choose from, but the three options we're going to look at here are relational databases, NoSQL databases, and finally graph databases, which are a form of NoSQL database. These three options make the most sense for how we're going to be storing our data. Let's start with understanding a bit more about each of these database architectures. Relational databases are the most common. They work by storing data in columns and rows. You access the data with SQL, or SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language. These kinds of relational databases are best used when the data you're working with has well-defined relationships. However, they are not as suitable for more fluid data. A big advantage, however, is the fact that these databases have been around for 20 plus years and have a huge amount of resources behind them. For example, the most popular relational database, MySQL, was developed in 1995 and has nearly 30 years of tested, high-volume use to ensure its reliability. The next database type is NoSQL databases. As the title suggests, these databases do not use SQL. There are many types of NoSQL databases, such as key value stores like Redis, document databases like MongoDB, and graph databases such as Neo4j. Key value databases like Redis are often used for storing ephemeral data, as well as data that needs to be updated and accessed very quickly. Document databases tend to be best for unstructured data, projects where data might come in many different formats, or where there's no relationship between data. On the other end of that extreme, there are graph databases. Graph databases are NoSQL databases that store data through relationships, similar to relational databases. That being said, they do not relate data in quite the same way that databases like MySQL and Postgres do. Rather than columns and rows, graph databases use nodes and edges, where nodes are the data itself, and edges are how the data relates. These databases are best used for projects 
where the data you're storing has highly complex relationships. So now that we understand all of these different options for modeling our data, we can decide on what database is best for Gearflux. After considering all the options, I decided that a NoSQL database would be the best choice, because we're going to be storing a wide variety of different data, from permissions, to ranks, to player statistics, and even other things. But the question remains, which database? Well, I'm already using Redis for a number of the server orchestration systems, so it might make sense to use that for everything else as well. However, Redis is designed to be an extremely fast ephemeral database, and while you can make it persistent, that's not what it's built for. Graph databases might be a good choice, however, I don't think that Gearflux needs that level of relational complexity. So that leaves us with one choice left, document databases. But now the question is, which one? There are many good options, but the one I went with is MongoDB. There are a few reasons I chose Mongo. The first is that it's by far the most popular and widely used document database. It also has been around for quite a while, and is used in production for many large-scale applications. The second reason is it probably has the best developer experience when it comes to setting up a database fast. All you have to do is go to the website, make an account, and boom, you get a free MongoDB cluster that remains free as long as you're under 500 megabytes of data. Not only that, but Mongo Compass is a fantastic GUI tool for managing and visualizing the data, which can be somewhat more cumbersome than other databases, which rely mostly on third-party tools. The fact that MongoDB has its own free tool, and that it's quite good, is a huge help. The final reason is I've worked with a few SQL databases in the past, and I was eager to learn something new. Next, let's take a look at the way MongoDB handles some of its core operations as it's one of the defining features, and it's important to understand when working with it. When we're talking about databases, you might hear about something called CRUD. CRUD is an acronym that stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete. These are the four basic operations that can be performed in any database. But for this explanation, we can further abstract these concepts into simply read and write operations. Each of these operations has a different cost. Cost is just how much time it takes to complete the different operation. The cheapest operation you can perform on a database is a read. The main reason for this is that databases are highly optimized to retrieve vast amounts of information very quickly. Another reason is that no concurrency conflicts need to be handled because no data is being changed. Write operations, on the other hand, are much more expensive. This is caused by a few things. The data not only has to be written once, but indexes might also need to be updated as well. Indexes are a bit of software magic that creates a structure that allows the database to access data more efficiently. Essentially, they work like a book's index, allowing the system to quickly find the location of specific data. Another reason write operations are slower is because of concurrency handling. Let's say, for example, we have a video, like the one that you're watching right now. Let's say you click the like button on the video. At the same time, another person watching the same video clicks the like button. The database has now received two write operations at the same time. So how can it handle this? First, let's look at the way MySQL, more specifically InnoDB, which is the storage system MySQL uses, handles this problem. Because it is physically impossible to have both operations received at the same time, because you can always have a smaller division of time, one of the operations will be handled a split second before the other. When this happens, the database will lock the value so it cannot be changed until the first write operation has been completed. If any more write operations come in while the first request is being processed, the database will queue them up and execute them sequentially following the same locking principle. This process is called concurrency control. However, it's not the only way to handle the issue of concurrency writes in databases. MongoDB handles this problem a bit differently, with something called optimistic concurrency control, or OCC for short. OCC works on the principle that write conflicts are few and far between, so it does not use any kind of locking system. That being said, OCC still has the functionality to deal with write conflicts if they occur. Let's go back to our example with the video and the like count. Let's say we have a document in our MongoDB database that represents the video. In MongoDB, our documents are stored as BSON, which is kind of like JSON, BSON meaning binary JSON. So let's say it looks something like this. We have our video ID, our title, and our like count. Now just like before, we're going to send two requests to update the like count at the exact same time. Here's what happens. Operation A starts and increases the like count from 10 to 11. At the same time, Operation B starts and also increases the like count from 10 to 11. Then, Operation A is committed updating the like count in the database to 11. A microsecond later, Operation B attempts to commit. However, before it does, it detects that the document has been modified since it made a copy to write on. The behavior that happens next is entirely controlled by the developer. Either the operation can retry with the updated copy of the document, or it can simply be cancelled. It's also worth noting that every write operation is atomic, meaning it either writes the full value to the document, or writes nothing at all. This prevents cases where for some reason, the writing could be interrupted before it can be completed. If the documents were not atomic, it would leave half-written values and could lead to data corruption. This method of OCC can be faster, 
especially in scenarios where the right conflicts are infrequent. However, it can make things a bit more complex when dealing with the rare conflicts that do happen. It is worth noting that MySQL also supports OCC for handling certain concurrency scenarios. So now that we have our database and we understand some of the core concepts behind its design, how can we use this for the permission system? Well, another reason I chose MongoDB specifically is because it allows us to use graph queries. These are not quite as complex as true graph databases, but they can be a huge help in optimizing our permission lookups. Why is that, you ask? Well, remember that our permission system is stored in trees. These trees are just graphs. This means that whenever we want to query a permission, we can use MongoDB's graph lookup feature to optimally traverse our permission tree and retrieve the information we need. So there we have it, a fully functioning permission system, properly synced across our network. This system might not be the most interesting, but I did enjoy working on it quite a bit, as I was forced to learn a lot about databases and how they function. I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of all there is to be learned when it comes to working with databases. But that being said, I have learned a lot, and I hope by watching this video, you have too. Let me know if you found any of this interesting in the comments below. Also. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and consider subscribing to see more content like this. With that, thank you everybody for watching, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day.